Come on, Mary. Come on. Good evening. You can see we have a bunch of folks joining us. I'm going to just quickly remind everyone if you have a second, lower uh, left hand corner of your screen. Well, on most devices, it's the lower left hand side. You wouldn't mind muting yourself. That would be handy. I can sometimes figure out how to do it on my end, but it's just easier if you take care of it. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. We're waiting on just a few folks. like we are mostly in. For those of you that I'm just letting in now, if you would just take a quick moment and mute yourself at the bottom of the screen, as much as we love interacting with all of our guests, it is a little easier to give this presentation um, if there isn't a lot of background noise. have a few more folks so I will let our last few stragglers in after we get started here. So for those of you that don't know, my name is Rebecca Banis. I am the Director of Outreach Marketing and Events at Wild Care. I am relatively new and still extremely excited to have joined Stephanie's amazing team. Um, even in this very strange environment, we have some pretty fabulous things going on. And for those of you that follow us on social media, you will have seen a lot of photos recently of our new sort of brood of babies that continues to come in, uh, which means that we need supplies. Uh, some of you have been very generous already. We thank you for the lids and baby bird food supplies. Um, but if you have not had a chance to give and you would like to do so, this Saturday, the 27th, we are hosting a virtual wild baby shower. Um, you can drop off a baby gift from our wish list. You can find that on Facebook, um, or if you get our e-blast, you probably got an invitation to this already. You can drop off a gift to help feed our babies uh, into the summer. From 10 to 1 in the afternoon, we will be doing Facebook Live updates to give you some patient updates. You can meet some of our educational animals. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at the end of the day, we will be raffling off one of our very lucky gift givers, and they will win a wild care basket of goodies that's valued at over $100. So we're very excited for this weekend. Um, we also are going to be doing these virtual events throughout the summer. So be watching your email for updates on what is coming up next. We are, as a reminder, offering all of this content free of charge. We're happy to share our knowledge with the world and we appreciate your support more than you could possibly know. That said, we do appreciate donations in any amount. Um, every $5 helps us save a life here on Cape Cod of one of our wild neighbors. So if you are able and you have a minute, you can log on to wildcarecapecod.org, make a, even a modest donation is very much appreciated and we will put that to very good use. So I think we are mostly in. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to our executive director, Stephanie Ellis. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Can you hear me okay? Okay, and just um, a reminder that I will be answering questions after the program. So if you can go ahead and type your questions into the chat, um, Rebecca will be looking at those and then she'll read them to me at the end. I'm going to share my screen, which always makes me nervous, but it usually works. Let's see. You are screen sharing. 
Oh, great. Rebecca, can you see this? Okay, wonderful. Um, so I am so excited that you all have joined me and that I'm taking you to the Eastern Islands of the Galapagos this evening. Um, these are blue-footed boobies and I will be talking about them in my presentation. Okay, so uh, first thing first, where are the Galapagos Islands? Uh, so they're located about 600 miles off of the coast of Ecuador. And the Galapagos Islands, they're actually a national park, and that's National Park um, of Ecuador. And so when I visited the islands, you have to fly in, um, and usually you fly in from this large city here, which is called Guayaquil. And so we flew in from Guayaquil to San Cristobal, which is this island here. And on this trip, I visited the Eastern Islands. And so what I'm going to do is basically go day by day, um, tell you what we explored each day, which islands we explored, um, with a lot of photographs and a lot of wildlife photos. So um, the Galapagos Islands, they consist of, it's actually an archipelago. And um, it's over 17,000 square miles covering ocean and land. And it's pretty extensive. Um, and Galapagos consists of over 20 volcanic islands. And I think in the last 200 years, there's been 50 eruptions. So the volcanoes are still very much active. Um, some of the volcanic eruptions in the last 200 years have destroyed the land. Some have also added to the land, as you can imagine, by creating new islands. There are also over 42 islets. And as I mentioned, Galapagos um, is a national park since 1959. Uh, something that's fascinating that we will be talking about is that um, Galapagos is home to the only penguins in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, the reason for that is because of ocean, cold ocean currents, um, Antarctic currents that sweep through this area at different times of year. And also, most of you probably are familiar with the Galapagos Islands because you think about Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, these islands have been forming for millions of years, and animals um, that were washed ashore to Galapagos Islands um, millions of years ago, they met very, um, very easy environments, very hospitable. And so they were able to find food, and animals were able to adapt to certain niches on these islands. Um, Galapagos is home to over 2,000 endemic species, which is absolutely incredible. For those of you not familiar with the word, endemic refers to um, species only found in that location. Uh, so you can imagine this is a pretty special place that deserves protections um, when you ha have animals and plants that only live there. And uh, Galapagos Islands straddle the equator. So we passed the equator. I think we may have even had a cocktail as we were passing the equator. Um, and something I learned quickly is when you're at the equator, you are closer to the sun. The rays are stronger. And so you quickly get a sunburn on your head, um, which I ended up getting some headgear to help me with that later on in the trip. As I was mentioning, uh, there are five ocean currents that converge um, in the Galapagos. And the Antarctic current, the, called the Humboldt current, is what carries chilly water into the area, allowing the penguins um, to live there. Oops. Excuse me, I'm just updating. I just clicked something that made all of you disappear, and I would love to see your faces. So let me try this again. Okay, yay, gotcha. Also of importance, um, so it, let's see, 97% of the Galapagos and the surrounding waters are protected. It's a National Marine Reserve and a UNESCO heritage site. And this is so important as you see, as we go through the slides and you see um, the incredibly diverse landscapes and animals in these locations. Okay, so let's start with day one. Um, and first of all, I feel like I need to tell everyone that I am not endorsed by Lindblad National Geographic. 
<laughs> I wish that I was, um, but I had just an extraordinary trip and I feel going um, on a trip with National Geographic is, you know, being with the, the best of the best, top naturalists, it was incredible. Um, so you can imagine, so we flew into San Cristobal, we took a bus, and then we were greeted by this Zodiac um, in this small port. And San Cristobal, by the way, is one of the islands that is actually populated on the Galapagos. There are four islands that are populated. Um, and so we were greeted by this Zodiac, which then took us to the mothership which was uh, the National Geographic Endeavor 2. And imagine, I just, I remember being absolutely overwhelmed knowing this would be my home, my home on the sea for seven days. Um, this is extraordinary ship. I had never been on anything like this. And it had about a hundred, around a hundred passengers. So here we are in the Zodiac getting onto this beautiful ship. Um, once we got on the ship, you know, there were safety drills and instructions and details on how uh, the days were lined up. And then they actually took us to a spot for the afternoon where we could disembark for an hour. And um, that spot was called Puerto Bacarizo Moreno. And this is the uh, capital of Galapagos. And this was our first introduction to the friendly or the approachable, I will say, wildlife. And so this was November 30th. And I couldn't believe I got off the boat, beautiful green waters, clear. I saw Pacific green sea turtles swimming alongside the dock. Um, and Galapagos sea lions were everywhere. This is actually, I should read you the description. Um, uh, just have to find it. Um, Puerto Bacarizo Moreno. Uh, the capital of the Ecuadorian province of Galapagos had, it had an interpretation center, which I never got to because I was too busy looking at the wildlife, you guys. Um, but also it says, chance to explore picturesque waterfront, home to one of the largest Galapagos sea lion colonies in the archipelago. And you can see this, this sea lion, we literally just walked right by him, did not care. And then I saw my first, um, nursery of Galapagos sea lions. So they're referred to as a crash. Um, here is a mother with a pup, but basically it was a bunch of pups where they lay together on the sand and they wait for their mothers to return from the sea, usually in the afternoon so that they can nurse. And it's an absolutely beautiful sight. And I really hope that you guys like sea lions because you're gonna see a lot of photos of them in this presentation. <laughs> Okay, um, so then we, we had dinner, we went to sleep, and you get extremely excited about the next day. And I have to say, when you travel with Lindblad, the schedule is incredible. It's absolutely packed with things to do. Uh, and you don't have to do them all, but you know, it's like, how can you resist? Um, and they have a little bit for everyone. So if you don't go deep water snorkeling, you can go bay snorkeling. If you don't snorkel, you can go on a glass bottom boat. So it really was very accommodating for everyone. So the second day, the first thing we did was go to Gardner Bay, Española. And you can see here, I was in absolute awe. I could have stayed here forever. There were sea lions all over the beach. This is Española Mockingbird. Uh, there are four endemic mockingbirds on the islands named after the particular islands they inhabit. Uh, we did see all four. And so this is the Española Mockingbird. Uh, white sands, warm waters. I was thrilled. I'm from Cape Cod. So, <laughs> you know, people were saying the water was cold. I think the highest temperature we swam in was 67. And I was like, this is balmy. I, I got this. I'm, I'm a Cape Cod girl. Um, so I was in the water on this day. So much fun. Uh, my first time also deep water snorkeling. So here we are on the boat. Uh, gearing up and getting ready to go out. Here's our boat, always in the distance. I love this photo. It's the rays coming down. It's like the mothership. It was so welcoming to see every single day. Um, so what we do is we depart on the Zodiacs. I think they see 12 people. We went to Gardner Bay, as I just showed you. And then this happened. Um, this was one of the most amazing experiences for me. This sea lion, uh, Galapagos sea lion, male, 
he swam right by me, just barking and barking and barking, uh, basically telling males to stay away from his harem. And I was not a part of his harem. Uh, so he did not even pay attention to me. It was like I was a rock in the water. And I just love, this is a spectacular photo. I just was filled with joy. Amazing creatures. Another thing, um, sort of, you know, an, another iconic species that you think of when you think of Galapagos is the Sally Lightfoot crab. They were everywhere. I think we probably saw them on all of the islands we visited. Um, and they also are very approachable. I have a little video here where you're going to see two Espanola mockingbirds uh, move to the right and you'll see the crab scurry out of the way. <laughs> and you can see all the larval, um, the, the rocks there, it's all volcanic rock. Could everyone see that? Okay, great. Um, more Galapagos sea lions, just absolutely beautiful. And the greeting of the mother with the pup in the afternoon after the mother's been away all day, you cannot help but be anthropomorphic. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful thing to witness. Okay, so that was, um, we had visited the bay. And then we have lunch on the boat. There's often a, a talk, a special presentation, and then an afternoon trip. So for the afternoon trip, we went to another part of Española. And you can see here, you can't see it very well, but I have better photos. Um, there is a marine iguana here. So this was my first introduction to marine iguanas. I need to play you this video of this pup. Notice all the pups in the water. <laughs> so that was me laughing. I couldn't help it because all of those pups in the water, this is another example of a crash or a nursery where they're, um, you know, they're inshore, they're safe from hammerhead sharks and uh, they're learning to swim and play and probably hunt fish. And then these two were just fooling around and Santiago, our guide for that part of the trip, was explaining to us how the young sea, sea lions love to drag the marine iguanas by the tail in the water. And it's a, it's a really fun game for them. As you can imagine, it's not fun for the marine iguanas. <laughs> uh, Santiago said that they absolutely hate it. I can understand why. They also can't breathe underwater, so. I love this photo. This is slightly out of focus, but it just it's like a Jurassic Park scene. Uh, marine iguana and our mothership in the back. And marine iguanas, by the way, this is the only marine iguana in the world. Uh, they are an aquatic and land species. They eat seaweed and they have salt glands, which allow them to drink seawater and take in high volumes of salt. Um, <laughs> I love this photo. <laughs> um, this was incredible. Santiago, our guide, said, please, we're going to walk through the lizards. Just don't step on their tails. And so, you know, I kind of thought he was joking, but literally there were cases where you're walking over them. It was just incredible. They're just all sunbathing. Look at this beauty. What an extraordinary creature. So this is a male. And so when I was there, it was the end of their drought season, going into their rainy season, which is also coming into the breeding season for marine iguana. So these colors represent a, a male who's in prime condition for breeding and attracting the female. They take on these beautiful colors. Um, and interestingly, when we were there, there, some of the islands were extremely dry drought-like conditions. But what the guides told us was, you know, another month, everything would be lush, rainforest conditions. But being there during drought period was a really good time for a lot of the nesting, for us to see a lot of the nesting birds. And here's one example. We 
couldn't have timed this better. So waved albatross, they only nest on Espanola, um, which is an Eastern island. And I absolutely love this photo. Seeing these birds up close was extraordinary, an experience of a lifetime. Um, and I don't know if you can see in this photo, this big brown lump, that was a waved albatross chick. And these photos are mine. Uh, so you can see, this was with my iPhone. So you can see how close we get to these animals. You can get within six feet of them and they don't seem to show any signs of discomfort. Another sea lion pup. <laughs> Can't get enough of them. I'm also excited because Phil Smith is watching today and I have a lot of his photos in this presentation. <laughs> okay, so one of my absolute highlights of the trip, I really wanted to see Nazca boobies. Um, Nazca boobies are very closely related to our northern gannet. They're also related to the pelicans, anhinga, frigate birds, um, and the other boobies. But I was really excited to see them. And on Espanola, they nested in a huge colony. I don't know if you can discern from your view, most of this is whitewash, but it's also dotted with boobies. And by the way, it's Nazca booby, not NASCAR booby. Um, Nazca referring to the tectonic plates which form the Galapagos Islands. Um, but look at these faces. I mean, the pattern is just extraordinary, isn't it? And they, <laughs> their call sounded to me like those silly straws that I played with as a child, very high pitched whistle. I have a video where you can hear that a little bit later. So this was the landscape there, volcanic, uh, dry, beautiful, definitely felt like we were in another world. And then this, this reminded me of home, uh, fall foliage. The colors were beautiful. I also love there was this blowhole water sp sprouting up um, from between the rocks because we were, if you can imagine, we're on this large island it, um, that is, is high and we are surrounded by water. And if you can see here, there's an albatross head. So there was an albatross nesting and all the mist from this blowhole was coming across the albatross. I had to remind myself, I was expecting to see, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex come out anytime. <laughs> um, so here's a lineup of lizards, marine iguanas. And this sea lion was the only sea lion, at least on the trips I was on, um, who was aggressive towards us. He wanted us to back away from his harem and he charged us at one point. And it's the first time I saw marine iguanas, or the only time I saw a marine iguana move quickly to get out of the way of this giant beast who was not happy. <laughs> Look at his face. What a beauty. I love their heart-shaped nose. And by the way, these Galapagos sea lions, um, I believe they are not endemic. They are, they were evolved from the Pacific uh, sea lions of the California coast. I believe the Galapagos fur seal, which is actually not a seal, it's a sea lion, is the only endemic species there. Um, this video, I'm going to be quiet so you can hear it. This was an example of a mother returning at dusk and uh, the reunion between her and her pup. That one, that one's mother did not come back yet. Can you guys hear my video? Oh good, I'm so glad. And that mom, she's probably like, I'm sure she was tired and done with her day. And then she comes back to that kid. Um, I was so happy to be able to see that. It was incredible. So these are Nazca boobies. A uh, beautiful sunset, and we had to say goodbye to Espanola, which was one of my favorite places. Although as I go along, I'll keep saying, it was my favorite. <laughs>
so the next morning we were off to the island of Floriana and this was early disembarkation and I am not an early bird but I became an early bird on this trip just so I wouldn't miss anything and I'm really glad that I got up early because this was our view first of all our zodiacs waiting for us um, volcanic structures in the distance beautiful sky and Floriana again one of the eastern islands uh, southeastern islands it's here so here we are getting ready and this is my dear dear friend Elizabeth she took me on this trip a trip of a lifetime that I would not have been on without her um, and I am so incredibly grateful because it changed my life. And she is an early bird. So she was, I think she was ready to go at 4 a.m. So here we go. We get onto the Zodiacs. And we were not disappointed because we were treated to this incredible view. Uh, volcanic hills and flamingos. I did not expect, I did study what I was going to see. And I do not think I expected to see flamingos on the trip. Um, it was an incredible view. We also saw young flamingos, which I have a picture of. I mean, look at these birds. Um, that's true color from diet. This is a young bird. We actually saw a young bird being fed by one of the parents. I had only seen flamingos in the zoo. And then to see them in this remote, incredible location was really something special. Um, a Pacific green sea turtle had just nested here. This was our view. This was our view. And I stepped into the water here and there were about 15 rays in the water. I couldn't get a photo of them because their shifting of sand and water makes them very difficult to see. But I was happy to be in the water with them. Uh, this was our guide. Oh my goodness, I can't remember his name, but he was wonderful. And, you know, for all the trips, you could certainly each day stick with your favorite guide, but honestly, they were all so excellent in different ways that it was really fun to go with different people. So he was showing us um, bones and sea urchins. And I did not take many pictures of flowers, but the flowers, it, even in the drought season, were so tropical looking. So this is um, a blue, I think our first blue-footed booby that we saw up close, except it didn't have blue feet because this is a baby, a baby booby. Um, I do have pictures of adult boobies with their brilliant, their classic blue feet. Okay, so this was an interesting day. Well, first of all, on the right, this is a brown knotty. This is a Galapagos sea lion. And then this creature, if you can notice that it's a little bit bigger, its head's kind of pushed in, it looks like a seal. This was the one um, Galapagos fur seal, the endemic species, the one that we saw. And again, it's not a seal, it's a sea lion and it has these long, long feet, um, which seals do not have. Seals move around like a caterpillar uh, where their front, you know, their front flippers are not as useful for them on land as these long flippers for the sea lions. Um, so anyway, but what's interesting about this, and I apologize if there are any children in the audience for this next graphic, oh, it's not yet, graphic image. Um, this was a little excursion just by Zodiac to go into some of these, um, uh, around some of these islets and go into the crevices and look at birds. Notice this incredible, desert volcanic-like habitat. These are cacti, uh, so bizarre. This is Galapagos sea lions. And then something extraordinary happened. We were in this little cavernous area and these two frigate birds, which if any of you have seen frigate birds are very large, ominous looking bird, quite beautiful, pirates of the sea because they like to steal food instead of finding it themselves. Um, so all of a sudden these two frigate birds came around us and they were like swirling and twirling and they kept dropping something and we could see that it was a chick of a swallowtailed gull, which of course made me sad, but I was happy, you know, relieved. It wasn't a human issue. It's something they do in nature. And so what happened next, I did not expect, but the frigate bird dropped the chick like right to me. I couldn't believe it, you guys. I couldn't believe it. I'm in the middle of nowhere in a Zodiac with 12 people and these birds drop me a chick. 
and thank goodness it was just taking its last breaths. Um, you know, it didn't, so I didn't have to do a humane euthanasia or anything. And then I threw it back to the birds and our guide on the boat was going crazy. Uh, his name was Christian. He was like, oh my God, this is amazing. The birds are so close. And um, people got great photographs and video of this. And I was sad for the chick, but I was glad that he was actually gone because I don't have the tools in the Galapagos to do wildlife rehabilitation. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, okay, so Floriana. So this was a super highlight. This was an amazing day. You know how much I love the sea lions. Uh, so this was a day where we went snor snorkeling, deep water snorkeling around this area called Champion. And this is where I had really close interactions with sea lions. And I'm going to play you a couple of videos. So I don't know if you can tell, I tried to slow that video down, but um, this sea lion he at first was dancing, <laughs> literally dancing with um, one of the, the leaders in our group who was snorkeling. The sea lion appeared to be mimicking his body movements. And then he turned around, looked at us, and he came right up to me and rolled over as if to get a better look. And so I just couldn't believe. I remember I jumped like, ah, I, you know, you're not used to wildlife approaching you. And you're in their environment. Um, so it was absolutely it was just such an incredible experience. Yes, he rolls over like, let me get a better look at you. <laughs> um, and then this, here's a great one, you guys. At the end of this video, you will hear, it sounds like walk, 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 walk. And I came to realize on this trip that when these animals are ascending or descending, uh, they're releasing air and they make this sound. And I loved when I heard that sound because I knew they were near me, but also I would see all the fish scatter. Um, so listen for the sound at the end. <laughs> it was awesome. He looked right at my face. It made me so happy. <laughs> so that was obviously a super highlight. I wish I could fast forward. I don't know if I, oh yes, I can. Looked right in my face. I looked right into his eye. It was un unbelievable. And I saw every scar on his fur. And then I wished him well. So sweet. Okay, so <clears throat> here's what it looked like. Snorkeling changed my life. I did not want to get out of the water. I had a snorkeling partner who said that they should have tied a rope to me and they could have just dragged me through the water for all the seven days <laughs> because I didn't want to get out of the water. There was so much to see. So I wanted to give you an example of what I was seeing when I was snorkeling. So this will show you what it looks like above the water and what it looks like below the water. It's pretty incredible. There were fish everywhere, coral, starfish, white-tipped reef sharks, Galapagos sharks. Um, everywhere you look in the water clarity was quite good. Um, except for one day when it was really rough and I had uh, snorkeled twice that day and I think I was finally waterlogged um, but the water clarity, I remember seeing a banana in the water which was interesting. There was a fishing vessel there but um, the water clarity because it was churning was poor, but otherwise the visibility was quite good. So after all these excursions, when you get off the boat, there are these little, there's this board with these little pegs. We were room 320. And this says um, onboard and outboard. And what you're supposed to do is 
you're supposed to always mark your peg to show if you are on board or out board. And um, of course, people forget. And so what they would do was it was sort of a public shaming at the dinner where they would call out all the names of the people who were still outboard <laughs> to make sure that they actually were in house. So it was so funny. My partner, Elizabeth, um, she kept forgetting. So I didn't even know where she was. And I just wrote that she was on board. <laughs> I was pretty sure she would be on board. Okay, <laughs> so let's talk about tortoises. This is incredible. So Santa Cruz, this is the one day that we were on land. And um, it was quite the experience. You can see Santa Cruz is here in the middle of all of these Eastern islands. And did I write down? I didn't write any notes, but Santa Cruz has, I want to say, it's the largest population of people of any of the islands. I should have written down, forgive me for not writing down the number. Let's see, maybe it's here. I did not write it down, um, but I believe it has the largest population of people. I want to say 200,000, don't quote me on that. So, the excursion I chose to go on here was to go to uh, the Darwin Research Institute. And I'm so glad that I did because this is where since 1976, they have had a captive breeding program to reestablish tortoise, Galapagos tortoise populations on all of the islands. And so you can see here, this represents the island and how many juveniles they have um, from those specific islands. They're bred in captivity, but they're going back to those islands. And then a total of 1,286 turtles. Um, this sign is the best sign I have ever seen. It says it all. Basically, you know, iguanas and tortoises this way. That is my favorite sign. So this tortoise has been in the news a lot lately. I am so thrilled that we met this creature. This is Diego. He is the super, super stud of the Galapagos. Um, you've probably heard recently in the news that this is the tortoise that had so much sex he saved his entire species <laughs> and now he's going home. Um, well, Diego, he was actually removed from Española, his homeland, in the 30s. He was then in captivity at San Diego Zoo. Um, and then in 1976, he came to the Darwin Research Institute to be a part of their captive breeding program. I'm thrilled I was able to actually meet him. Not personally, but I saw him. And um, even better, if you heard the recent news within the last week, Diego has fathered 800 offspring of Galapagos tortoises and has populated 40% of Espanola. Um, in 1960, there was only 15 tortoises left in Galapagos. By the way, this is um, the largest land tortoise and Galapagos tortoise is endemic to uh, Galapagos. And, um, but I need to tell you the backstory. The backstory is that um, the tortoises were in massive decline because in the 1700s, when whalers found out how rich these lands are, um, whalers were harvesting them, sometimes 200 at a time. They came to learn that tortoises can survive up to three months without food or water um, at the bottom of a ship. So they literally stacked them and it was basically like a meal on a shell for three months. It's very, very sad. And the population was decimated. And for other reasons, introduction of domestic species um, brought by also whalers, uh, goats, cats, um, goats decimated the habitat for the tortoises and there was no food. The great news is Diego and a handful of other tortoises were just released back to their homeland and there's now a population of over 2,300 tortoises. So thank him for being a super stud. It's amazing. <laughs> and these were some of the babies you saw and you could see it says Santiago, so that's where these youngsters would go. Um, be released. They're released after five years old. At that time, they don't have any natural predators. 
Um, and a lot of these islands that they're being released onto are not inhabited, so we don't have to worry about cars, poaching, etc. I wanted you to see this photo of this gorgeous, um, this is not a marine iguana, it's a land iguana. And um, I did see them in the wild, but my photos are so terrible that I just want you to see what one looked like up close. But he was at the Darwin Research Institute. Love this, that photo. On Santa Cruz, probably more exciting for me than the tortoises, um, we went to Puerto Ayora, and that's um, basically like a little, um, it's a harbor. And there was this fish market there small fish market and there was so much wildlife there. You can see the Galapagos sea lion begging for food. You can see this big mama Galapagos sea lion, great blue heron. If we have time at the end, I will show you a wonderful video of all the, the interaction of these animals with the people. I mean, look at this, look at the sea lion. And he's got a smile on his face, but I can tell you they had fly swatters. They're literally stepping over the sea lions to serve people. Um, and then they, one woman had a fly swatter, so if, they, if the sea lions would get up on top of the cooler, she would swat them <laughs> with the fly swatter. They're like little dogs. It was unbelievable. I could have spent all day there. It was amazing. Look at this lava gull. Lava gull, also perfectly named. He was a pirate. Someone left a bag of bread, and just like a gull, he was in it, stealing the bread. And, Two and a half minutes. So funny. So this is um, what the port looked like. Just beautiful. Sally Lightfoot crabs. You guys, there were even marine iguanas begging for food at the fish market. I, my photos are terrible, so I didn't include them, but a marine iguana went into one of the fish buckets and then was like, oh my god, how do I get out of here? <laughs> Just claws and dinosaur face. So funny. I loved this animal. And they do, at the end of the day, they get fish scraps, which is why these animals are hang, waiting patiently all day. Siesta, Galapagos sea lion style. This was also at the fish market. Um, but also the, that port area was so beautiful and so colorful. These were the native lobsters. Okay. So tortoises. So I showed you the tortoises in captivity and then we took a bus, we took a bus to El Chato Ranch. And this is basically, it is um, preserved land for the tortoises. So they run free here. And on the way to El Chato, we saw tortoises on the side of the road, grazing, grazing with cattle, grazing on the sidewalks, um, grazing with horses, cattle egrets, it was incredible. So here's the Galapagos tortoise in the wild. Something you'll never forget. These magnificent creatures, some of them 100 years old, living out their life here. They are completely unfazed by us. They couldn't care less. Um, I love this photo because I was just so happy. I also love this sign. Um, do not touch the tortoises. I can see how it, be, it would be tempting, um, but do not touch the tortoises. Here's an example of how close uh, we were to the tortoises. Here's a primordial soup that they were all sitting in. There's a, mm, I can't remember the name, you guys, but I want to say white cheek pintail was in here also dining. This was incredible. Love this photo. Grass all over his head. It was so lush there. So here's an example. Most of the islands we visited were drought conditions, um, but it was so lush and heavy fog on this island and it was just beautiful. And if you can imagine tortoises that weigh several hundred pounds produce very large poop. So I had to get the poop photo so that you could see. Okay, December 4th. Uh, so we visited Dragon Hill and Guy Fox, L. Eden and Daphne Major which are um, islets, where are they? Oh, they're around, they around here. Yes. Let me read you a description. It says, 
habitat of the colorful Santa Cruz land iguana, the photo of which I showed you the animal in captivity. Um, land iguanas that have been brought back from the brink of extinction. You will later have the opportunity to snorkel along the steep invertebrate coated walls of the islets of Guy Fox. Um, this was a very pretty area. Look at this volcanic, volcanic structures, blue water, white sand, black neck stilt, which we have here east coast and you also see them, um, you see them uh, largely on the west coast. But look at this environment. It was very drought-like here. And I want to say that this was the one day it was in the 80s. Galapagos is very temperate, 65 to 75 year round, ideal, ideal conditions. Though so you have periods of heavy, heavy rain and then periods of drought. Um, but th these were cactuses, they look like people to me. It was a forest of cacti. Um, here is that gorgeous land iguana again. And what was fascinating to me was, so it felt hot. Um, you're close to the sun, and these land iguanas, they lay under their favorite cactus, waiting for the fruits to drop. And this is their whole life in these months. They are not territorial. They are not thinking about breeding. They are thinking about surviving. So we literally saw land iguanas who could have been sitting for weeks under a cactus waiting for the fruit to fall. Um, I was sad that on this island there were feral cats and they were hunting lizards, uh, native lava lizards. And um, so cats are trapped on the islands. <laughs> Again, this is an island that is not this portion, but this is a, an island that is inhabited. And so cats have been introduced. Um, but our guide said also there were some years where the cats suffer as well from the drought. Uh, so it just, it made me sad. It's just not a good situation all around. Look at this clay type soil, volcanic structure. There's the blue footed boobies, the classic blue footed boobies. What a beautiful, beautiful and ridiculous creature. So these are adults with the bright blue bill and the bright blue feet. Love this shot from my friend Elizabeth, timeless. Uh, youngster, blue-footed booby. These are Galapagos petrel. And I have failed to say that we ate so well on the boat, you guys. And when I first got there, I was like, I'm not going to drink anything and I'm not going to indulge. And every night they had these captain's cocktails with native fruits. And that I can tell you that by the end of the trip, I was like, could I have two captain's cocktails? <laughs> I'll have the desserts. <laughs> so a typical evening would be uh, a sunset on the top of the boat, um, usually a captain's cocktail. There'd be a presentation after dark, dinner. And so this was an evening, uh, cervezas and frigate birds. Frigate birds were often flying off of the bow of the boat, which was quite extravagant. These are some volcanic islands. This is what a typical evening looks like on um, the Endeavor 2 with Limblad. Okay, so this is the highlight of my trip, you guys. I keep saying they're all highlights, right? Um, this truly was the highlight. So I was telling you that um, Galapagos penguin, this is um, their northernmost breeding location. Um, excuse me, their southernmost breeding location because of the cold, uh, humble currents. And so our guides told us that there's only about 2,000 of these endemic birds in Galapagos. And so if we were to see two or three of them, that would be, that would be huge. That's a big flock, uh, two birds. So where we were, uh, Bartolome and Sombrero China. Where was it? Oh, here. And Sombrero China was referring to a volcanic structure which is shaped like um, a Chinese hat. Okay, so this was the best day ever. My scalp was burned close to the sun, so I bought this little scarf with a booby on it, and I had a booby on my head, and everyone was asking me where I bought it. <laughs> it was a hit, and it protected my scalp. 
but I bought it on the ship and it's my most favorite souvenir. So here we go, we're ready to go snorkeling and see some penguins. Here is the Chinese hat, sombrero chino, with our boat. Okay, so this, this is so memorable to me. Um, we first, we did some bay snorkeling here on this day. I love this structure. It's so recognizable when you think about the Galapagos. And what we did was um, we snorkeled around and went around this pinnacle here. And while we were out there, we saw some penguins, but they were in the distance. Um, here's what the penguins look like up close. They're quite small. I think they might be... I wish I could remember every fact. One of the smallest species of penguins in the world, the only penguin to live north of the equator. So what happened next was extraordinary. Um, I want you to watch, you see these little heads? In this head, my partner Rob, and my partner Rob said, Stephanie, and I, my head was underwater and I looked up and he said, the penguins are coming right at you. And thank God, I put my GoPro underwater really quick and here's what happened. And that's me laughing at the end. Ho, 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 ho. It was, I slowed down the video. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I need to play that again so you can see. See all these little heads? And then they go underwater. I could have touched them. So <laughs> I had thought I would see two penguins, and that's nine penguins. I was absolutely blown away. What beautiful creatures. They're a small bird and um, I was in awe. I could see bubbles on their backs. Just incredible. And as if that wasn't enough, I was the last one to the boat, you guys. I was one of those people because on my way back, making my way back from the penguin bonanza, um, I swam over this. It will come into better view. Um, this is a white-tipped reef shark, and he's just chilling, um, swimming along the bottom of the water. I'm not sure why the video jumps. I apologize for that. Probably because I slowed them down a little bit. But I don't know if you can see, there's a white tip to one of the dorsal fins and a white tip to the tail. And these animals are docile. Um, you know, they are, they have absolutely, absolutely no interest in people. Um, people are not harassing them. Everything's very protected. I also swam with a Galapagos shark. It's incredible. So that was just such a great experience. So I was one of the last to the boat. <laughs> For good reason. <laughs> They're like, what the heck is she doing? Um, if we have time at the end, I do have some more videos and I have a Galapagos shark video. Uh, and basically, the, the um, snorkeling, I had never really snorkeled before. And here I am, deep water snorkeling, meaning we were in deep water, which I honestly preferred because there's so much coral, so much life, that when I did the bay snorkeling, I found that um, I didn't want my feet to rub against all of these delicate features. And there's also sea urchins. And so I love the deep water snorkeling. And you're always safe. You learn safety codes, you learn um, different things for, for pointing out different species of animals, you know, like shark, <laughs> if you see shark, universal symbol for shark. <laughs> I think turtle was something like this. Um, but always you have a guide in the water and then you have a guide on the zodiac. You need to know your zodiac number and there's symbols for basically saying like, I'm done, get me out. Um, so always, always, I felt so safe and you're always with a partner. I just feel like I need to say that in case any of you go on these trips and you're, and you're scared. I was terrified the first day and then you couldn't get me out of the water. Um, okay, so Genovisa, this was the last island we visited, December 6th. And it's funny because our guide that day, his name is Christian, and he said to us, 
in our zodiac. He said, this place is the icing on the cake, you guys. And I'm thinking, icing on the cake? Like, how could it be better than everything I have just experienced? Well, first of all, Bird Island is what they call this island. And we were looking up at these steep volcanic cliffs. These are all frigate birds, red-footed boobies. And I need to read you the description. Known as Bird Island, enjoy hikes among nesting colonies of swallow-tailed gulls, frigate birds, red-footed booby, Nazca booby, all while keeping a lookout for hunting owls. Um, ride zodiacs along the base of the caldera wall and snorkel amongst large schools of parrotfish and other tropical species. Um, so we climbed these steep steps called King Philip Steps, and I did not know what to expect on the other side. Here's uh, Christian, our guide. We go up the steps, and this is what we see. We're basically on a flattened volcano with nesting birds all around us. This is the largest uh, nesting colony. Over 40,000 red-footed boobies nest on this island. Just, and, and our timing was perfect because birds were, ne everyone was nesting. So these are Nazca boobies and their chicks. Um, this is what it looked like. So again, drought, habitat, drought uh, environment. These are Nazca boobies. I loved their footprints. You know, the booby family, they have these beautifully large webbed feet, as you can see here. They incubate eggs on their feet because they're very vascular um, and it distributes warmth to the egg. And so I thought that their feet and their feces were works of art. This is a booby, could care less about us walking by. She's like, yeah, this is my egg. <laughs> and this is just an example of how close we are to these animals. Um, this, I love this again, works of art with the feces, looks like a mandala. I couldn't stop looking at them. And here is, um, this was the warmest day. I think 82 degrees, it felt warm. Um, I think it was the warmest day. It was a warm day. And so this chick is, um, Gular fluttering, which is basically birds don't have sweat glands, so they have to cool off by fluttering their, their chin and their throat, and then through evaporative cooling, they lose that um, excess heat and fluid. And so that was, he was fine, it wasn't that hot, but I love how they sit up when they have those huge feet and those little chicken wings. Beautiful birds, good mama. Um, so this is a video. I'm going to be quiet for this because you are going to hear the um, the whistling sounds of their call, and it sounds like a silly straw. As you can see, not super elegant birds. <laughs> Could you hear that? Could you hear their sound? Okay, good. I do have to, um, I have baby mice and they're on their wheel. I wouldn't normally stop in a presentation, but I hear mice going around on a wheel. <laughs> okay, so this is a red-footed booby. Look at this incredible color, you guys. Um, just absolutely exquisite. And this is true to life. They're absolutely brilliant and then have the bright red feet. This is a youngster. You can see the downy feathers and still quite colorful. So there were boobies everywhere, in trees, on the ground, babies everywhere. It was a sleepy day for a lot of the birds. Siesta on Genovisa. And um, this is a magnificent frigate bird on the left and a striated heron on the right. And I just love this. This was incredible. You see a lot of different species nesting together and they all benefit because they all have different behaviors and different strategies for, strategies for 
getting rid of pred predators, they all benefit by nesting together. So here you have Nazca boobies. This is a baby frigate bird. Over here, um, there's red-footed booby who was not thrilled when an adult came to feed this chick. They were sort of beaking at each other like, get out of my space. They're always usually a, a bill's length apart. Just some gorgeous, gorgeous images. Frigate bird, um, red-footed booby. This is a young red-footed booby. And so you can see they don't have the red feet. They're uh, uniformly brown. And then this was fascinating, you guys. So I kept seeing petrol, pieces of petrols everywhere on the ground. And I was wondering what was preying on them. And you can tens of thousands of petrels. It's the largest petrel breeding colony in the world, uh, storm petrel. Four different species breed there. So the, the sky, aside from all these other birds, the sky on the coast this. Um, I love this photo. This is a short-eared owl. We do have this species here. They're a little bit darker in the Galapagos and often referred to as um, Galapagos owl. And we actually saw, we saw a short-eared short -eared owl take a petrel um, out of the air. It was really interesting to see. Beautiful, beautiful bird. Um, so that was Genovisa, basically on top of um, the highest point on the island. And then we had lunch and we get ready to go on our second excursion. And I almost, you know, this was the last day and I was feeling sad, I'm not going to lie, because I didn't want it to end. It was so incredible. Um, and I almost didn't go on this trip. And I'm so glad that I did because it was a really perfect farewell. Um, the beach and the water was beautiful. This is basically uh, Genovisa in Darwin's Bay. Uh, so we're in the Bay Area. This is where we saw a lot of swallowtail gulls up close. And this was the bird, um, people asked me which species touched me the most. And I obviously loved the penguins and the sea lions. But the swallowtailed gull, I've never seen a more exquisite bird. Delicate, beautiful gull the only nocturnal gull in the world. So notice the red eyes. This is for filtering in light in dark conditions. And um, we were told on the boat to keep our shades closed at night. And I wish we hadn't, because only on the last day did I learn that the swarms of insects on the top of the boat at night would bring in the swallowtailed gulls to devour them. Um, and if I'm ever on that boat again, I'm keeping my shades open, or I'll probably be on the top deck at the 2 a.m. to watch them. Um, so this is one of the, uh, this would be the Genovisa mockingbird, endemic mockingbird in red blue. Um, so this was interesting. We were talking about creches or nurseries. On this part of the island, there was a creche of um, red-footed boobies. So these are all baby boobies acting very foolish. And as you can see here, a booby actually landed on one of, um, one of the girls on our boat, landed on her head. It was so ridiculous. It was on her head for like over 20 minutes. I think everyone on the trip, excuse me, has pictures of this bird on her head. Um, the beach was largely fossilized coral, which was so beautiful. And uh, the swallowtail gulls were courting, mating, talking. Um, I have a video where you can hear their vocalizations. Just absolutely look at that bird. It's a beautiful, beautiful animal. Incredible. You can see the light was beautiful. It was getting to be um, towards dusk. There were more, there were baby frigate birds, baby Nazca boobies. The plants were lush. And I took this photo, I'm not a photographer, but I love this um, because, you know, Galapagos is a place where the people, the number of people who can visit is limited. And that is what kept um, the lack of fear in these wild animals and is what has kept these areas pristine. So we go back to the boat 
and I was so sad and we had to all put our gear away so that it could be washed. So this is what it looks like. It's very colorful and I love this photo. Um, and then the next day we disembarked um, to go to the San Cristobal airport and then fly to Guayaquil. So it was quite the incredible adventure. And um, let's see, I'm just gonna check the time. Oh good, it's early. Okay, so, you know, I called this presentation the untouched lands, um, but they are hardly untouched. They're in good shape now, but they were not. Um, the Galapagos Islands were discovered by Europeans when the Spanish arrived in 1535. And honestly, most people found the islands to be inhospitable. Um, volcanoes that are active, if you can imagine, and um, some swift currents and changing currents and the islands are shrouded in fog for a large portion of the year. Um, so I believe actually that a Galapagos in Spanish is a twist on a meaning, meaning bewitched. They felt like these islands were bewitched. It wasn't until the whalers in the mid 17th century who came out and basically destroyed and decimated the land. Uh, they decimated forests, uh, which supported wildlife and grasslands that supported tortoises. They introduced goats and pigs as food species. You can see there's been, there was a very active program to remove the goats and the pigs because they're non-native species who are absolutely depleting uh, the food sources for these endemic species. Um, invasive species is a problem for Galapagos. I can tell you that they do not, you cannot bring in a seed, um, you know, like wipe your shoes, no plant material, uh, no snacks from the boat onto the islands. They're very, very careful because, uh, you know, a single invasive plant species can be devastating to the native species. I was surprised I had seen a banana in the water, but it was because a fishing vessel was right there and they, obviously they had littered. Um, illegal fishing continues to be a problem. As I mentioned, these beautiful islands are over 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. It is very, very difficult uh, to monitor those waters carefully. Um, they have all sorts of techniques uh, that they're trying, I think even drones, um, to get a handle on illegal fishing activity. Then the demands of more than 160,000 tourists per year, I think it's over 200,000 at this point. Um, I'm happy to tell you that, so the one species we didn't see that I had hoped to see, but I certainly was not disappointed, was the um, flightless cormorant. You know, the cormorants with a little stubby wings, uh, like vestigial wings and barely feathers on their wings. So what I was told was that National Geographic, they're one of the biggest tour companies in the world. When we got off the boat, two hours after, the next group was going out, but they can't take um, successive groups to the same location. Um, the National Park Service, they really limit the number of people who can go out to these islands. So the next group was going to the Western Islands where they would see the flightless cormorant but guess what? They wouldn't see the waved albatross. <laughs> so I lucked out anyway. The waved albatross is incredible. Um, there are, they won't even allow kayaks in certain places with groups because it's, um, I can't remember the exact term, but it's not aesthetically pleasing. I did ask about plastics and climate change because we did see a deceased Pacific green turtle on one of the islands. And I was told that plastics, I didn't see any plastics, everything looked pristine, but I was told that they do conduct research. Plastics are a problem with ingestion, especially, you know, seals are going um, hunting um, outside of the islands and coming back. And certainly that's a problem for them. And then climate change is a problem in that they have uh, more intensified periods of drought and rain. And so sometimes when they have periods of intense rain, it's followed by severe, severe, extensive drought. And one year on Espanola, from what I understand, 
I think over 75% of the marine iguanas did not survive. Um, so untouched lands, but um, <laughs> hardly. And oil spills, my last thing. I couldn't believe that two weeks after I got home from this trip, did you all read about the oil spill? I think it was over 400 gallons of oil that was spilled off San Cristobal, which is that city that we flew into. It's um, inhabited by people. And so I couldn't find any information about it, but apparently they got it cleaned up and said that no, um, no species were harmed in the spill. As we all know, that's not true because oil, we all know about Exxon Valdez and Costco Busan and uh, the Gulf spill and how that leaks into the sediment and affects the water quality and just trickles down to absolutely everything, microorganisms. Sorry to be such a downer, um, but Galapagos is in good shape. I, like I said, why didn't I write it down? I think 97% of the islands are protected in the waters and it's absolutely beautiful. This is that pinnacle rock, Bartolome, where I saw the penguins, by the way. And let me see the time. I do have some time to show you some videos. But I also wanted to say that this field guide, my friend Elizabeth gave this to me for the trip. I absolutely loved it. They call it a pocket guide. It's a little too big to fit in your pocket, but easy to transport on a trip. Beautiful illustrations. I loved it. It includes insects, plants. It also talks about um, history, a little bit about um, geology and geography. And importantly for most people traveling, when you can see these animals and what they're doing. When we were there, like I said, it was drought season, but about to go into their rainy season. It's a, that is a really, really good time. This is like early, um, excuse me, early December. That's a really, really good time to see a lot of the nesting birds. And I actually wrote down for you guys, December through May is their rainy season. February through April, the sea calms and the wildflowers bloom, which would be really incredible to see. June through November, you have the, that cold current, okay, um, but also drought-like conditions, the cold current coming through the water. So, before I show you um, my videos, I just have to thank, I had some really extraordinary travel companions <laughs> and wonderful people who I met on this trip. Um, on this trip, you had National Geographic staff who you spend time with, you have dinners with them. Um, some of the trips, many of the trips had a photography focus. So you weren't walking quite the, as long of a distance because you're focusing on photography. And one of the people who really impacted me he was terrific was um this gentleman here tom peschak so he, i think he told us he's one of only seven or eight actual staff wildlife photographers for nat geo and i highly recommend writing down his name and checking out his instagram page because he is an absolutely incredible photographer and we got to i learned so much from him and i'm not even a photographer we also get to see a lot of his presentations and some of his work also on the trip, I met this gentleman from Ontario, and he, we were inseparable. Uh, everyone thought he was my husband, and that was fine, because he, he was my best friend for the entire trip. Elizabeth is my dear friend who took me on this trip, and I'm so grateful to her. And then I met these extraordinary people. Um, before we went to the Galapagos, we actually did a National Geographic extension where we were in Quito and in the cloud and Choco rainforest in Ecuador. And that's where I met um, Janet and Mervyn here on the left. And we were so thrilled to learn that they were also going to be on the National Endeavor too. And so I met them there from Indiana and uh, Katie and Phil Smith. You saw a lot of Phil's photos in this presentation. And so I just wanna thank you guys. I love you guys. I hope I can come to Indiana and see you. Or maybe you can come to Cape Cod. Okay, so I am going to try to share these videos. Chinese hat, Espanola mockingbird. 
Let's bring on my mom. Sounds of Janisa. It will take me just a second. I wanted to show you the fish market. Can everyone see this? Or do you see my entire screen? Stephanie, <laughs> 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 we're still seeing just the Galapagos, just the PowerPoint. Oh. We're not seeing the video. Oh, how, how about now? <laughs> We can hear it, but we don't see it. <laughs> Interesting. I wonder why that is. Hmm. When you share by application, you might have selected the wrong one. Okay, let me try again. Thank you all for your patience. Um, share screen. Um, this talk. This might work. How about this? Can you see now? No? No, we're still just seeing the folder. Darn, I'm so sorry. Well, I guess that doesn't work. <laughs> I could always post these onto our Facebook page so that everyone can see them. And so we can go to questions, Rebecca, if you are ready. Great. Um, I actually was going to ask you this last time and someone reminded me by asking today, you used a GoPro for your above water and below water photo taking? And yes. Video? Yes, I did. And it, it was my friend Elizabeth's and I didn't know how to use it. And I'm so glad that I tried because it was so worth it. Um, completely waterproof, really easy to, um, you know, you take the little card out and put it in your computer and download the images. And I think it was the GoPro, what are they up to now, 10? I think so. I think, I think it was the nine. So fully waterproof without the case. It was really, you can do slow motion. Um, it was great, so worth it. Um, so Priscilla actually asked, how frequently each year do they nest? And this was, let's see, we were about halfway through. I'm not sure exactly which bird it is. Priscilla, if you wanna, let's see. That's a really great question because I kept asking that. We saw yellow warblers everywhere. And it's interesting, we have yellow warblers here, but this bird, their song was different. And I kept asking, what is the season? When does that bird breed? And for some of them, they breed year round. It's temperate enough, um, but it seems like for a lot of the seabirds, we were at a prime time in which they breed. Um, on this book, uh, it tells you when uh, the different species are breeding. So if you have questions about specific species if you will type them in I can look that up um, so Priscilla was actually asking about the birds on Genovisa specifically okay so um, the birds on Genovisa so that was the frigate birds and the red-footed boobies and the Nazca boobies I believe that was their prime nesting season I want to look it up in the book but that will take time so I <laughs> I can email her back. Yeah, Louise, I have your email, so I think we'll look it up and send that to you. Um, and also, to answer one of your other questions, yes, um, they have deep water, bay, and they do also have glass bottom boats um, available for those people that don't like being in the water. And anyone that's curious, as we are recording this, it will be on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. You can share it with everyone you love. Yes. Um, they also had, they offered kayak, two different days of kayaking. Um, I did not go kayaking and I was really, it's the only, my only regret because on um, the first kayaking ex excursion, 
people said they were at ground level with the flamingos and that they were swimming with uh, kayaking with 65 or so Pacific green sea turtles. Oh so the next time there was a kayak trip, I signed up, but that was the windiest day. <laughs> I was in the water all day and I finally had had enough water. Um, and so I did not go on that trip, but I don't think they saw a lot on that day. I highly recommend pace yourself, but do everything. <laughs> Um, let's see, I think that's all of our questions. We do have someone who is supposed to go in January, but obviously with COVID, lots of people, oh, actually, do Galapagos seals migrate? Um, no, from what I understand, they are there year round, um, and this was pupping season. Um, let's see. So I think that's it. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Thank you, Stephanie. I've seen this before and I loved it even more this second time. So be sure you check it out on our YouTube channel or if anybody that you know or love missed it, they can certainly watch it there. And before we let all of you go, um, Louise, I know you're supposed to go in January, but Stephanie has a very fun announcement that she's gonna make. Yes, I'm so excited that um, I was approached by Nomadic Travel Company uh, to possibly lead a Galapagos trip for wild care next fall. And it will be, um, Nancy is um, the travel specialist and so she's looking into it, but we're thinking about maybe doing this with Celebrity or Lindblad and there would be a donation to wild care embedded into the cost. Um, and November, December is a great time to go for all the reasons I just mentioned. So this is um, a new development as of yesterday. So if you would like to be on an email list for upcoming information, um, please send Rebecca your email address, um, events at wildcarecapepod.org. And then as we put information together, I will start sending it to you. I'm so excited, I would love to take people out there. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can all tell from this presentation she's going to be the best target ever. <laughs> but you'll be spending a lot of time with, yes, with those blue-footed boobies. Thank you very much, Karen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you all so much for joining us. Again, we offer these programs free of charge. If you are able and willing, we appreciate a donation in any amount. Be watching your emails. We're going to be doing a lot more of this throughout the summer. And also, if you are on Cape Cod, you can visit us this Saturday, six feet, gloved and masked, of course, if you'd like to drop off a gift <laughs> to one of our wild babies. If you are not on Cape Cod, you can shop smile.amazon.com. That helps wild care with donations, and we have a wish list available on there that you can search as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we will see you all again very soon, I hope. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Thank you guys. You. Oh my God. Bye, Phil and Mervin. <laughs> Bye, Great <Jay>. job. <laughs> oh, this is fun. Nobody wants to leave. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And someone asked for the the email address again. Your email address. So for anyone that would like trip information, it's events at wildcarecapecod.org. It's the same email that you use to RSVP for this talk. I'm so Just excited. send it to that. I answer pretty much anything. You have bird questions, I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.